Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semuanya. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Selamat pagi Bapak Ibu, apa kabar hari ini? Semoga selalu dalam keadaan yang sangat baik. Dan kami ucapkan selamat datang dalam acara yang sangat istimewa hari ini, Toward Falls Pandemic Adventure Part 4, dengan tema yang sangat menarik yaitu Building Agility for the Next Generation Organization. Hari ini dilaksanakan hari Senin, tanggal 22 Juli 2020, spesial Bapak-Ibu karena live dari Indonesia and Utah Salt Lake City. Wow, luar biasa sekali ya. Dan tentu saja saya sangat berbahagia, Bapak-Ibu, perkenalkan saya Ibu Dara Sasotopo yang akan menjadi Master of Ceremony dalam acara webinar pagi hari ini. Bapak-Ibu hadirin yang kami hormati, hari ini sangat istimewa. Dan izinkan saya menyapa tamu-tamu istimewa yang sudah bersama kita, yaitu diantaranya kami mengucapkan selamat datang kepada Deputi SDM Teknologi dan Informasi Kementerian BUMN Republik Indonesia, Bapak Alex Denny. Selamat pagi. Kemudian kami mengucapkan selamat datang dan juga selamat pagi juga sudah bergabung bersama kita di sini, jajaran Direksi Holding Perkebunan. Kemudian juga sudah bergabung Direksi LPP. Selamat pagi. Kemudian yang sudah juga bergabung yaitu Ketua FHCI, Bapak Herdi Harman. Selamat pagi Bapak, Pak Haha. Kemudian juga kami ucapkan selamat datang dan juga selamat pagi kepada Direksi Human Capital dari seluruh BUMN ya. Ini di Indonesia, wow luar biasa sekali. Dan juga moderator kita yang sangat eksklusif. Pagi hari ini yaitu Gusti Kanjeng Ratu Hayu, Sugeng Enjang, Gusti Hayu. Kemudian kita juga ingin menyapa main speaker kita hari ini, Dave Ulrich. Kemudian Bapak-Ibu, kami tentu saja sangat mengapresiasi Bapak-Ibu semuanya bahwasanya webinar ini diikuti lebih dari uh, yang kita ekspektasikan, yaitu tiketnya sudah sold out, ini luar biasa ya, diikuti oleh seribu peserta. Terima kasih kepada Bapak-Ibu yang sudah meluangkan waktu untuk join di acara yang sampai akhir acara nanti pastinya juga akan sangat menarik kita akan mendapatkan banyak sekali insight. Bapak Ibu, kami mengucapkan terima kasih kepada penyelenggara acara yaitu Holding Perkebunan LPP Agro Nusantara dan juga FHCI. Terima kasih banyak. Dan untuk rules-nya untuk acara pagi hari ini yaitu untuk para peserta webinar Mohon maaf ini untuk interaksi hanya dibatasi di chat dan Q&A saja. Jadi silakan untuk pertanyaan Bapak Ibu nanti bisa sampaikan di Q&A. Dan kita nanti juga akan ada giveaway Bapak Ibu ada 10 buku yaitu 5 buku terbaru dari Dev Orich dan juga 5 buku terbaru dari Bapak Triaji, Rio Pratomo dan juga Bapak Alex Denny. Luar biasa ini. Nah, ini dia Bapak Ibu bisa anda saksikan di layar untuk bagaimana mendapatkan giveaway buku ini. Caranya mudah. Jadi silahkan untuk follow Instagram at Nusantara Planters, kemudian at LPP Learning, dan juga at Forum Human Capital Indonesia. Kemudian selanjutnya upload foto selfie terbaik pada saat mengikuti sesi webinar ini pada akun Instagram Anda. Dan jangan lupa untuk tag foto Anda ke nusantara.planters dan juga at LPP Learning dan satu lagi Bapak Ibu at Forum Human Capital Indonesia sertakan caption semenarik mungkin nah ini Bapak Ibu bisa sekreatif mungkin nih ya selama nanti kurang lebih dua jam silahkan untuk membuat caption semenarik mungkin agar nanti bisa mendapatkan buku kemudian yang selanjutnya sertakan hashtag Jeff Ulrich atau tagar ya ini dan juga hashtag satu lagi BUMN untuk Indonesia dan nanti pengumuman peserta terpilih akan disampaikan sebelum penutupan acara webinar. Silahkan Bapak Ibu yang tidak mendapatkan giveaway buku jangan berkecil hati karena Bapak Ibu yang mau memiliki bukunya silahkan bisa memesan buku tersebut yaitu buku Learning 5.1 dapat menggunakan link yang sudah tertera di layar ini. Silahkan Bapak Ibu mungkin bisa di capture nanti. Sekarang silahkan untuk di capture dulu rulesnya untuk mendapatkan giveaway Bapak Ibu sebelum saya lanjutkan. Baik, jadi ini seru sekali ya sampai akhir acara nanti. Silahkan untuk bergabung bersama kita karena jangan lewatkan kesempatan untuk mendapatkan giveaway. Bapak Ibu hadirin selanjutnya kita akan melanjutkan acara kita di sini. 
Tadi saya sudah menyapa Bapak Haha, Bapak Herdi Herman selaku Ketua Forum Human Capital Indonesia sudah bergabung bersama kita, Pak Haha. Selamat pagi. Pagi, Mbak Indra. Wow. <laughs> Luar biasa ini, Pak Haha. Baik, Pak Haha, ini kita uh, akan meminta beliau untuk menyampaikan sambutan untuk seluruh peserta webinar yang saat istimewa pagi hari ini. Untuk itu, kami bersilahkan kepada Bapak Herdi Herman, Ketua Forum Human Capital Indonesia untuk menyampaikan sambutan. Silahkan, Bapak. Baik, terima kasih Mbak Indra. Saya pertama-tama sapa dulu yang terhormat Pak Alek Deni, pagi Pak Alek, Deputi SDM Kementerian BUMN, kemudian juga ada Pak Abdul Ghani, Direktur Utama PT Perkebunan Nusantara, dan seluruh Direksi Human Capital atau Menguahi SDM BUMN. Kemudian ada Mitra Webinar, Direktur HCP TPN Pak Wing, terima kasih kerjasamanya. Kemudian ada dari LPP Agro Nusantara, Mas Triaji Prio. Terima kasih semuanya. Dan of course, we do specialist guest, Profesor Dev Ori. The one and only, the legend, <laughs> the guru. Actually, I met him the last time on July 2014, Dave. I'm your one of your participants in the class in Rose School Business. So it's, let's it's great to, it's great to see you again thank you yes. i'm honored and honored to be with you this uh, this morning thank you for much so saya juga ucapkan terima kasih kepada moderator kita mbak gusti kang jenderatu hayu terima kasih assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh salam sejahtera buat kita semua teman-teman uh, kembali kita menyelenggarakan satu acara untuk utamanya untuk teman-teman yang bergabung di komunitas Human Capital dan saya menghap diri present dari para penggiat Human Capital aktivis di Stephon Enterprise mengucapkan selamat bergabung di acara ini is really actually ini menarik banget nih ini temanya sangat menarik building agility for the next generation organizations tapi sebelum mendengar uh, arahan-arahan dari Pak Ale, kemudian dari Pak Kostri D. Sedikit saya terglans menyampaikan bahwa beberapa ini saya dipesenin sama apa namanya Direktur Eksekutif FHCI. Ini beberapa program yang memang kayaknya perlu diketahui oleh teman-teman. FHCI still doing the activities even though in pandemic COVID situation ya. Kita masih jalan program-program Certified Student Intensive Program 2020 karena kita pengen terus intensifkan di program-program ini. Join recruitment juga hopefully kita tetap jalan karena we do have still apa ya utang nih buat buat Indonesia karena kita janji terus merekrut utamanya dari kaum disabled, dari masyarakat atau pemuda Papua, KTI dan selanjutnya. Dan kita juga ada rencana kembali menyelenggarakan Human Capital Summit dan hopefully this is the biggest event ever gitu ya seperti sebelumnya dan ini on planning cuma nggak tahu nih suasana covid kita mesti reschedule apa reformat lagi nih acaranya dan kita masih diminta oleh pemerintah untuk bantu mengerahkan relawan relawan relawati untuk uh, covid 19 volunteers khususnya khususnya di wisma uh, atlet ya dan until Jun 2020 kita telah mengesain 260 orang ke sana. Jadi luar biasa kiprah teman-teman ini, teman-teman BUMN ini dalam membantu COVID belum bantuan-bantuan yang lainnya yang of course luar biasa. Dan we do have also program for Stephen Press Coaching and Mentoring Standardization. Dan kita apa namanya akan discuss also mengenai employee branding dan webinar progress sudah ada empat kali di session dan kita akan segera melaunch Human Capital Insight. FHC Magazine dalam waktu dekat ini. Next, nah ini bagian dari serial apa yang kemarin sudah diteruskan terkait dengan managing the day after tomorrow. Ada CEO series, CHCO series dan selanjutnya. Dan mungkin supaya tidak berlama-lama kita akan sampai kepada acara inti. Tapi ini kembali saya sampaikan di tengah organisasi yang memang unprecedented, yang di changing paradoxes, and complexities in the new normal, kita butuh butuh but 
to advise me dari Professor Day what need to be respond in different organizational mindset, skill set, and tool set to overcome challenges and reap the benefit from yet to be seen opportunities. So ini luar biasa untuk kita manfaatkan acara ini. Mudah-mudahan teman-teman bisa menikmatinya. Enjoy, fasten your seatbelt, and relax. Demikian, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Baik, terima kasih Bapak Hermi Herman untuk sambutannya yang sangat istimewa. Kemudian Bapak Ibu, saya lanjutkan acara kita kepada kesempatan hari ini. Kami akan mempersilahkan Bapak Alex Denny. Selamat pagi Bapak Alex Denny. Selamat pagi. Wow, luar biasa Pak Alex Denny. Baik, untuk itu kami persilahkan Bapak Alex Denny untuk menyampaikan keynote speech kepada kita semuanya. Silakan Pak Alex Denny. Baik, terima kasih. Selamat pagi semuanya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, Dev. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, Bapak Ibu yang berbahagia, saya doakan semoga semuanya sehat-sehat karena kesehatan adalah modal yang paling berharga bagi kita. Dan mudah-mudahan kita bisa menyongsong minggu awal minggu ini dengan energi yang sangat positif, diawali dengan learning. Ini sudah seperti ayat yang pertama turun, ikrok. Jadi, aktiviti pertama yang kita lakukan di Senin pagi adalah learning. Karena itu saya salut kepada PTP, PTPN Holding, dan LPP yang sudah menginisiasi seminar yang sangat bergengsi ini. Ya, tidak mudah untuk mendatangkan Profesor Dave uh, ke dalam sebuah seminar, apalagi dalam kondisi pandemik seperti ini. Tetapi thanks to technology, ya, kita bisa melakukannya uh, bahkan jauh lebih mudah arrangement-nya ketimbang physical uh, conventional seminar. Nah, Bapak-Ibu, uh, seperti yang beberapa kali kita sudah dengar bahwa COVID-19 is just a trigger to accelerate the transformation. Long before the pandemic, actually, kita sudah melihat fenomena di mana perubahan dunia berjalan jauh lebih cepat daripada yang kita perkirakan. Karena itu, kita uh, manfaatkan momentum ini, ya, trigger dari pandemic ini, untuk betul-betul secara jeli melihat kesempatan di balik kesulitan-kesulitan yang ada, sehingga kita bisa memberikan nilai tambah yang lebih besar bukan hanya kepada BUMN, tetapi juga kepada bangsa dan negara. Karena itu, insight-insight yang kita dapatkan pada setiap kali kita melakukan sharing-sharing seperti ini, mudah-mudahan bisa memberikan penajaman-penajaman kepada senario-senario yang sudah kita buat untuk menjadikan BUMN tidak hanya kompetitif secara global, tetapi juga diharapkan menjadikan BUMN sebagai salah satu talent producer untuk Indonesia. Sekali lagi, terima kasih kawan-kawan PTP, LPP, dan juga FACI, Pak Herdi. Mudah-mudahan tidak bosan-bosan, kalau perlu tiada hari tanpa learning, karena actually learning is part of the job, it's part of our daily job. Jadi bukan sekedar dijadwalkan kita belajarnya seminggu sekali, dua minggu sekali, harusnya ini adalah menjadi bagian dari keseharian kita. Karena itu selamat menikmati pembelajaran hari ini, semoga apa yang diberikan bermanfaat buat kita semua. Selamat pagi, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi Terima kasih Bapak Alex Denny, Deputi SDM Teknologi dan Informasi Kementerian BUMN Republik Indonesia. Pak Alex Denny, kita jadi tambah semangat nih karena Pak Alex Denny ini selalu menyemangati kita untuk setiap hari untuk selalu belajar, belajar, dan belajar. Jadi kan belajar itu seperti pekerjaan kita ya Pak Alex Denny. Baik, Bapak Ibu, seluruh peserta, wah ini sudah semakin banyak, sudah 800 partisipan. Kita sesaat lagi akan menuju ke sesi tersebut, tapi sebelumnya saya akan membacakan CV terlebih dahulu dari moderator dan juga main speaker kita hari ini. Yang pertama saya akan membacakan CV dari moderator kita, dari Gusti Kanjeng Ratu Hayu. Baik, ini sudah hadir di layar Anda Bapak Ibu.
Sudah baik. Ya, baik. Baik, sudah. Baik, saya akan bacakan terlebih dahulu untuk CV dari moderator kita. Untuk pekerjaan Bapak Ibu dari 2020, ini saat ini ya, sebagai Chairwoman of Advisory Council dari Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta, DIY, Leading Advisory Council on Non-Academic Issues with University Representative from Various Stakeholders. Kemudian selanjutnya, Beliau juga penghageng tepas tanda yeti Keraton Yogyakarta, daerah istimewa Yogyakarta, Bapak Ibu. Leading the IT and Documentation Division of Keraton Yogyakarta. Responsible for the whole IT roadmap from conceptualizing to execution. Aiming for total transformation from paper based to computer based system. Baik, selanjutnya ini mungkin uh, Bapak Ibu bisa uh, baca sendiri, Bapak Ibu. Wow, luar biasa. Kemudian kita akan lanjutkan saja, Bapak Ibu, untuk selanjutnya ke Dave Ulrich. Oh, baik. Luar biasa. Oke, okay, kita sudah bersama Gusti Hayu. Baik, oke, okay, baik. Dan uh, sebelumnya saya akan bacakan CV untuk Dave Ulrich lebih dahulu. Francis Likert Professor at the Rose School of Business University of Michigan, a partner at the RBL Group, a consulting film focused on helping organizations and leaders deliver value. He has published over 200 articles and book chapter and over 30 books. He edited Human Resource Management 1990 until 1999, served on editorial board of four journal on the board of director for Herman Miller's. 16 years, has spoken to large audience in 90 countries, performed workshop for over half of the Fortune 200 called successful business leaders, a distinguished fellow in the National Academy of Human Resource. He is known for continually learning, turning complex ideas into simple solution and creating real value to those who work within three fields. Baik, Bapak Ibu, sudah Hadir bersama kita, Gusti Hayu, langsung saja kita akan mulai. Sebelumnya saya akan menyapa terlebih dahulu, Gusti Hayu. Sugeng Enjang, Gusti Hayu. Sugeng Enjang, Mbak. Ratus Pundi, Pak Warto, Sugi Pundi, untuk menikah, Gusti Hayu. Saya, tapi ini nanti roaming loh, Mbak. Kalau bukan bahasa <laughs> Jawa. <laughs> baik, baik. Kalau begitu kita kembali ke bahasa Indonesia saja ya, Gusti Hayu, nanti daripada roaming. Baik, dan uh, tapi luar biasa sekali, Gusti Hayu, pagi hari ini. Jadi partisipan kita ada seribu partisipan, Gusti Hayu. Dan yang istimewa sesi ini, ini live dari Indonesia dan dari Utah di, diikuti oleh seribu peserta. Dan ini adalah sesi pertama Dave Ulrich di mana menggunakan tiga bahasa. Bahasa Jawa, kemudian bahasa Indonesia, dan juga bahasa Inggris. Sekalian muri-uri kabudaya nih, Gusti. Baik, Gusti Hayu, kita sudah tidak sabar untuk mendengarkan sesi dari Gusti Hayu dan juga Dave Ulrich. Untuk itu, waktu kami silakan pada Gusti Hayu untuk memandu acara pagi hari ini. Silakan, Gusti Hayu. Ya, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, ya, jadi uh, langsung saja ya. Dengan pandemi dan uh, COVID itu semua tatanan no, yang kita tahu adalah normal itu udah berantakan. Semua sudah berantakan. Sehingga ini merupakan jadi tantangan nih. Jangan hanya dilihat sebagai ancaman. Uh, semua, semua bisnis, semua organisasi mengalami kesulitan. Banyak perusahaan harus uh, merumahkan karyawannya. Banyak yang sudah putus asa, terus bagaimana kita harus menyikapinya, bagaimana kita harus bisa membawa organisasi kita ini untuk bukan hanya survive, tapi juga thriving. Nah, di sini kita bersama Dave, tidak ada yang uh, lebih capable, karena tadi uh, achievement-nya itu kan sudah sangat panjang, saya berusaha untuk tidak mengulang, tapi yang paling istimewa itu, saya baca di CV-nya, Dave itu continuously awarded as top influential HR leaders 
bahkan called the father of modern human resource. Uh, kalau gitu saya izinkan saya mulai menyapa. Uh, good morning, Dave. Good morning. Um, selamat pagi. And I know I did not say that at all well. I apologize, but thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Gusti, for inviting me and uh, allowing me to present this morning. Thank you. It's an honor. Uh, allow me to um, uh, inform the audience how are we going to conduct this session first in Indonesia. Yes. Uh, jadi, untuk sesi ini, uh, Dave akan menyampaikan materi kurang lebih selama 90 menit. Nanti di tengah-tengah materi, beliau akan uh, berinteraksi dengan para audiens, akan memberikan pertanyaan. Nanti untuk yang ingin menjawab, bisa dengan fitur raise hand. Uh, itu nanti dari host kita akan membantu untuk uh, unmute. Nanti juga di akhir materi, uh, se maaf, sepanjang materi disampaikan, peserta juga bisa mengajukan pertanyaan melalui fitur Q&A. Nanti untuk, jadi kalau Dave yang bertanya, silahkan raise hand. Tapi kalau mau mengajukan pertanyaan ke Dave, silahkan lewat Q&A sehingga nanti akan kita filter dan kita kita pilih pertanyaannya. Hmm, kurang lebih hanya itu saja. Kayaknya dari tadi udah terlalu banyak yang ngomong. So, please, Dave, we cannot wait to uh, hear what you have to say. I am so honored and humbled to uh, be there. I'm sorry I don't speak in Indonesian, and uh, I hope the language will translate and the ideas. I'd like to share my screen, so let me make sure I can share my screen, and uh, you can see my slides. Let me just double check to make sure that everybody can see this screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, Dave. Uh, Gusti, okay, thank you. Um, first of all, let me say I'm just humbled and honored to begin a Monday morning with you, the beginning of a good week around uh, in Indonesia for leaders and for organizations and the board members. Um, I'm especially thankful for the sponsors. As I've noted here, thank you for your encouragement and your sponsorship. I am gonna begin with the end. I know people often want copies of slides, so here's a QR code, and here's a website where you can get copies of the slides. Uh, we're also taping this, you can get a copy of the tape, and I hope you'll follow me. And so, let me just introduce a little bit what I hope to do today while you can write down the, uh, uh, the QR code or take a picture of it if you'd like. I'm a professor at the School of Business, in the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. And I spend a great deal of my time until the last three months when I've not been traveling, um, going to companies and try to figure out how does a company succeed in a changing marketplace. Now I'm gonna share with you one of the things that's really fun, and I wish I could be there in person in Indonesia. We have about a thousand people observing and others watching the video. But one of the things that's fun is when you get to come to my office and you're in my home, I can share more personal things with you. So I will share a couple of personal things that describe what I hope to do today. This is one. This is my dissertation. It's the research I did many years ago with an enormous amount of statistics. I did statistics before they were even popular to do statistics. And my dissertation is on what's called taxonomy. Taxonomy is the science of simplicity. How do you take something very complicated and make it simple? And that's what I hope to do today. I hope to take this complicated issue of next generation leadership and agility and make it simple. By the way, I should give you a warning. When I did my dissertation, there was a group called University Microfilms that sold the dissertation. And you won't be able to see it here, but it took me two years to do my dissertation and I made $11.85 US. So for two years, I got paid $11, and I've kept the check because it uh, shows you the value of that work. But I'm gonna simplify, and I'm gonna try to help you get to know a little bit about my orientation and ideas. I love statistics, and this is just a backdrop. As we see the future and agility for next generation leaders in Indonesia, I've done a lot of research with my colleagues around talent. 
we collected data on 450 companies throughout Asia to figure out what do we do to drive and encourage people. We've done a lot of work on organizations. How do you define capabilities like agility? And how do you intervene? And we've written 10 books on organizations. You introduced me graciously as human resources. We've done an enormous amount of research on human resources. We've got 30 years of data with 100,000 people in a dozen books. But on the bottom left, we've studied leadership. And that's what we're gonna focus on a little more tonight, is what's the next generation leadership, particularly around agility? And how do we begin to make that happen? And so tonight, I'm gonna to turn all of that data into something fairly simple. My goal is to give each of you who are listening some ideas, some ways of thinking that will have impact, that you can use in a very concrete way to help you be better as an agile leader and to help your organizations build agility. In the pre-work that working with Panji and my great appreciation to Panji for the service, I was told that many of the folks on the call are on boards of directors and many others are leaders from high to middle in their company. I'm gonna talk very briefly about boards and then I'm gonna answer five questions. Why agility matters today in firms in Indonesia, in Latin America, in Russia, in Europe. Why agility matters so you can have a case for agility. What agility means and what are four definitions of agility? Where agility applies, and I'm gonna talk about four places where we should use agility. How do you institutionalize it? How do you institutionalize agility? Through our human resource systems, and I'll talk about four practices. And very finally at the end, who? What are the implications for the boards and for leaders all the way through the company? When you're done, I hope you'll have an ability to better create the next generation leadership and the agility required for success. And I know we're gonna answer questions and I appreciate Gusti monitoring the questions and I'll turn to you as our uh, expert mo moderator and see are there questions as we go through and I'll stop once in a while to respond and then at the end have more time. I should also say that there are people here from both private and public sector. I do most of my work in the private sector, but I've also done work in the public sector. I said I'd share at a personal level, my father worked in the public sector. He was a forester, and then he worked in social service programs. A few years ago, my children made up a book about my father that I could read to my grandchildren. So this is a drawing of my father. This is your great, great grandpa. This is a picture of my father on their anniversary. And this is a picture of my father and his truck. So that's my father. In America right now, it's Father's Day. And uh, it's a day that we pay tribute to our fathers. So let me pay tribute to my father who worked in the public sector. My father taught me aggressively that what we do in the public sector is to serve. And so if you're a leader in the public sector, I hope you have that ethos of service. In fact, just a, an image of my dad. When my dad retired, every day he would take his truck and go to a local store and pick up day old food and take it to the needy. And so for 15 years of his life, he would pick up food in his truck and take it to those in need. I appreciate public sector. Okay. <sighs> Having said all that, I'm grateful for the sponsors. I'm so privileged and I wish I could be with you in person, but I'll let you inside my home in some very personal ways as a, as a, as a, as a recompense. I'm gonna cover a lot of material. And I know that in the next 90, 80 minutes, 70 minutes, you're gonna get overwhelmed. You can get a copy of the slides and we're gonna answer some very simple questions. The first question is, what do boards of directors do and senior leaders do? What do they do? They review things that help us succeed. They advise, they oversee, and they manage. So where content, where should boards focus their attention? And where should I as a leader focus my attention to help my company, public sector or private, be successful? We've discovered that in the content at the top left, 
boards and senior leaders should focus on four things, financial, strategic, operational, and organization or technology. And so here's the question that we often ask. In order for a company to succeed in the marketplace and sustain our growth, top and bottom line, we have to focus on the items in blue. Strategy, we need to know our business. Where are we gonna compete? Where are we gonna win? How are we gonna win? What's our strategic agenda? Financial, we have to make money. If we don't make money, we don't succeed. We have to have access to capital. We have to manage our capital structure the way we borrow money and manage risk. Technology or operations, we have to manage information systems, digital, critical issue, operations and work. Those issues in blue become so critical for us to succeed. Strategy, where are we going? Financial, are we successful in getting there? Technology, do we have the systems to sustain it? But the item in yellow is the organization. If we can't build a successful organization, our strategy is a vision without action. Our financial agenda is a set of hopes without reality. And our technology is a set of data without application. It's the organization that becomes so critical to our success today. Now, what is that organization? It's our talent, the people, the workforce. It's our organization, the culture, the workplace, and it's leadership that combines those. We need to recognize as members of boards and senior leaders or leaders throughout a company that we've got to manage strategy, technology, and financial through the organization we create. One of the great exercises you might want to do in your company, and I'm going to give you a number of these, is to go to your senior business team and say, here's four ways that we have to work to compete. Strategic agenda, what's our business, where are we going to play, how we do we win, what's our vision, financial, how are we going to create profit, how do we have access to capital, how do we have capital structure and risk, technology and operations, how do we manage digital technology, and organization. And then ask each member of your business team to divide 100 points. What, which ones of those should we focus on now for us to be successful? Where should we focus to be successful and to succeed in the marketplace? I highlight in yellow organization because almost every company I work with, public sector or private sector, the organizational capability generally gets 35 to 45 points. It doesn't get all the points. Sometimes our strategy is unclear in the public sector. Or sometimes we don't have access to capital, financial. But generally, it's the organization that forces us to win. So here's the question we're going to answer tonight. Or this morning for you. It's tonight for me. I apologize. How can I, as a board member or a senior business executive or a leader, help create a more effective organization. You know, each of you have assumptions about that right now. If I had time, it would be so great to engage you. What do I think I need to do to build a better organization? And what I'm gonna do is give you six or seven points that will help you create a more effective and successful organization. So I've done my first piece, the role of boards and leaders. The boards and senior leaders have financial, strategic, technology, and organizational stewardship. And I highlight in red the stewardship tonight that we'll focus on around organization. So let me go to my second bullet. Why is agility so critical to organization? Why is agility so critical? I'm going to begin that with a test. And it's a fun test, and I wish I could see everybody's picture, but we have 800, 900 people, so I can't. I should ask the panelists to share with me their answer. But let me give you a very simple test. So play with me, and if you're with somebody, you could invite them to join you on this test. I can do the right thing, or I can do the wrong thing. I do the right thing, I do the wrong thing. I can do it well, or I do it poorly. So I've got right, wrong, well, and poorly. What's the best cell to be in? By the way, if you have trouble answering that question, there is not much hope for you as a leader. It's obviously cell one. I want to do the right thing and I want to do it well. We know that. I want to do the right thing and I want to do it well. 
So what's the worst cell to be in? Two, three, or four? And I won't embarrass you, uh, Gusti or Indria as moderators, but it's interesting that people could hold up their fingers. Most people say cell four, and I think they're wrong. I think the worst cell to be in is cell two, and here's why. I do something very, very well, and it's the right thing to do, but the environment has changed. The world changes, and the right thing becomes the wrong thing. For example, uh, one of the sponsors of this session is learning. Learning is no longer what it was even three months ago. And the right way to learn is evolving. And I've got to change. When the environment changes, I have to change. That's the assumption. And if we live in a world that's changing, the right thing becomes the wrong thing, but we keep doing it. In the automotive industry, we made long assembly line cars. Wrong thing to do. In the, in the retail industry, we built big footprints of retail stores, but along comes Amazon and other online retailers. Big footprint is the wrong thing to do. We need to avoid sell two. So how do we do that? Let me hit an assumption and then I'm gonna dive deep into something I was counseled to talk about. The assumption is very simple. Content, what we do is the king. But the context is the kingdom. In other words, the setting in which we work determines what we should do. That's true in Jakarta. It's true in Singapore. It's true in Bombay. It's true in the United States. So what are the challenges in the world? What's the context that sets the kingdom for the things we need to do? A couple of years ago, a number of years ago, actually, a company I know that's in 80 countries in the world, they came to me and they said, Dave, when I visit a country like Indonesia or uh, Taiwan or China, what should I look at that tells me about the context? And we identified six things, and they're very simple. What are the social trends in that country? So what are the social trends in Indonesia? What are the technical trends, technology, digitization? What are the economic trends, the global markets and competitors? What are the political trends? And there's political issues in almost every country. What are the environmental trends, the social responsibility, and what are demographic trends? If I understand those trends, I have a way to understand the context. So if I go into a country in, in, um, in Malaysia, and I say, socially, what's happening in Malaysia around families and diversity, technology, economics, political, environmental, and demographic? But if I had to pick one of those six, it's technology. The technology world we live in is changing so dramatically. And it forces us to rethink. And so I'm going to spend just five or six minutes, what's happening in the world of technology that forces us to become more agile. And I think we all get it. The fact that we're doing this session, I'm sitting in my house in the United States, 13 hours away from you. I could look inside other people's houses. I could look inside Gusty's house and see what's behind her. I don't know if you're at home, Gusty, or in an office. Are you at home or in an office? In an office, in the Elfie's office. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's much better to be at home because if you're at home, you can show pictures of your father. And uh, oh, this is the favorite picture. That's what I look like now when I go to sleep. Um, it's so different to live in this technology world. So let me take you on about a seven minute journey of what technology is changing so that we have to become more agile. I'd love to start with a test. Here's 30 words of technology, and you could probably add to it. Do I understand drones? Do I understand artificial intelligence? Do I understand blockchain? Do I understand machine learning, virtual reality, internet of things, gamification? These are the lingo of technology. And all of this is happening in the last few years in a dramatic way. And it's changing almost every industry we're a part of. 
and I know we have people from every industry. It's changing transportation to driverless cars. Quick anecdote, about 10, eight or probably about seven years ago, my wife and I were driving on a freeway in California, and it's where some of the early driverless cars were. We drove by one of these cars that did not have a driver. It was an automated car, and I knew it was the automated car. It had satellite dishes and, and pictures, and on the opposite seat, and I don't know if Indonesia drives in the left or the right, but there was nobody sitting behind the steering wheel, and this was the driverless automated vehicle. And there was just an article in America seven years ago, this car has 100,000 kilometers and no accident. So we're driving down the freeway, and I say to my wife, that's the driverless car. It's got 100,000 kilometers with no accident. And I looked at her and I grinned and I said, let's change that. Let's run into it and create an accident. And my wife quickly said, Dave, do not do that. Do not do that. It's not funny. By the way, that's bad humor. Um, but uh, transportation has changed. We have, and I don't know which service it is in Indonesia, but we have Uber, we have Didi in China. Retail is changing. Uh, online shopping versus in-store shopping in a huge way. Medicine, telehealth. Uh, I'm now doing uh, diagnostics, doctor on demand. Robots are doing cybernetics, connection to the body. This machine is no longer a phone. This machine is now a body monitor, and it monitors my phone in real ways. Manufacturing, food, delivery kits, lodging, education, and this is an example. I should add public sector. Uh, I think Singapore has done some brilliant work around public sector service and diagnosing. Technology is changing our world in a huge way. So in my simple, simple mind, what does technology mean? So here's what it means. We have to invest in new technology, artificial intelligence, robots, Internet of Things, so that we succeed in the marketplace. Financially, we have to manage our costs and create market value. Strategically, we have to be in the right business. You can't just be in a retail physical footprint. You have to be online. And technology, we can't do manufacturing the way we did it. So how do we invest in technology to succeed in the marketplace? And here's the answer. We have to access digital information. All the technology does is give me information. It gives me information about what the customer wants, what the employee needs, and gives me information about time and space and cost. Our job, if we're going to live in a digital world, is to create the organizational capability to deliver asymmetry or information through digital. That's it. In this digital world, with all of these new technologies coming, cloud data, the organization has to be changing our world, hygiene, recommendations. And what it's done is it's gone through some stages. When the virus started in January, February, it was like an accident. And you've got to respond. You've got to be a first responder. You've got to react. You've got to stop the bleeding. So people worked at home. We wore masks everywhere. We responded quickly. Then in terms of an accident, we got in an ambulance and we went to a hospital. And there we're trying to recover. So for the last 12 weeks, we've been in a recovery mode. Hospital, you get solutions. We're learning now to live with this pandemic. And then we go home again. And we've got to reinvent. We've got to embed those new learnings and adapt. In an accident case, some of that reinvention may be fundamental. For example, tragically, if you lost a limb, an arm, or a hand, or an eye in an accident, you've got to get a whole new identity. But a lot of us go home from an accident and we adapt to the new circumstances. That's where we are in the world right now in this pandemic. We're moving from recovery to reinvention. 
Okay, take a deep breath. I have just covered a lot of material, but it's a very, very simple logic. Content, what we do is critical. The context is the kingdom where we do it. And so how should boards and leaders respond to the digital transformation that's so prevalent and to the corona crisis and there will be other crises? In the United States right now, we're facing a social crisis around uh, racial inequality. I don't know what the crisis will be in Indonesia, but I almost guarantee that in the next five or 10 years, there will be one. How do we as leaders and boards respond? On the one side is a threat. We see what's wrong. We have people who are afraid and anxious and hopeless. Our organizations have low morale and strategic uncertainty or haze. Leaders are disoriented. On the right-hand side, we discover opportunity. And in the middle of a crisis, we focus on strengths. We give people a sense of hope, a sense of optimism. We create an organizational condition in red, which is what I'm going to focus on, of well-being, the right culture. And our leaders empower others. Take a step with me. I'm going to go one more step in this first question of why agility matters. In this organizational agenda, there are three things we can look at. Individual talent. Again, it would be fun if I saw you and I had everybody raise their five fingers. That's individual talent. Those are my people. Organization. The individuals are the five people that are talent. The organization is the culture, the workplace, the systems. And leaders combine the two. Let me say that again. If I, as a board of director member, or a senior leader, or a leader in the middle of a company, or a human resource professional, want to help my organization succeed in the marketplace, I've got to have individual talent, I've got to have great organization, culture, and I've got to have leadership that combines the two. That's it. That's such a simple, simple typology. We've done that in public sector, since I know I got a question about public sector. Uh, Pat Kemlo in Singapore, and I know Singapore is a neighboring country that, that has a great reputation for many good things, and one is public service. Pat Kem has said, in every ministry, in every agency, in every uh, group in the public sector, the business leadership team and the HR leadership team will ask three questions about their organization. Do we have the right talent? Move your fingers. Do we have the right organization, the culture, and do we have the right leadership? Those three things give me an organization that is successful in a changing marketplace. So I just went back. Instead of being threatened, we see opportunity and we create talent, leadership, and organization. Now I'm going to give you a test. And if I was wise, I'd have made this a poll, but I think polls distract, but it's really fun. If you had 10 points to divide, what matters more for business success? Is it the talent, my five fingers, Woo, we got to have good people, or is it the organization, my fist, and I'm going to hold off on leadership for just a minute. What causes us to win, talent or organization? I've given you a hint by the titles of the books. Here's what we find. Eight, two, organization. Eight, two, organization. The quality of organization has four times the impact on business success and customers and investors than does the talent. What an organization does is it takes the individual talent, the ingredients, and creates a great outcome. On Sunday today in, uh, in our home, uh, we were celebrating Father's Day, and I like, I shouldn't have confessed this, I like banana bread. So I was at a church meeting, and there were some people at our home, and they took the ingredients, flour, sugar, eggs, bananas, nuts, oil. And when I got home, they had turned those individual ingredients into a loaf of banana bread. By the way, I would show you the loaf of banana bread but I ate it all. <laughs> so it's down, it's down here in my stomach. Um, and I won't show you my stomach because that's where the banana bread is. Not all of it, but I ate most of it. That's what an individual has. You have the individual ingredients, but you create a great organization. 
that same phenomena, the organization is more important than the individual, is true in sports. I know Indonesia, I don't think, I couldn't find, I don't think Indonesia has yet won the World Cup. <laughs> in fact, that was kind of a joke. That's not Indonesia's forte, that's not your strength. But here's another test. How often is the leading scorer? He scores the most goals in the World Cup on the team that wins the World Cup. And it's very interesting, 20% of the time. 20% of the time, the individual talent, the man who scores the most goals, is on the team that wins. 80% of the time, it's teamwork. It's very interesting. That's true in every team sport. It's true in hockey, which I know Indonesia doesn't do as either. It's true in um, every team sport. The talent is less important than the teamwork. It's also true in movies. We looked, how often is the leading actor or actress in the movie that wins movie of the year? And so these are the last 10 movies of the year. How often is the leading actor or actress in the movie that wins movie of the year? And the answer is 20%. 20% of the time, the best talent wins. This year, the movie of the year is down towards the bottom left. It's called Parasite, the movie from Korea with um, uh, subtitles. I hope people have seen it. I, I have not seen it, great movie. That movie won movie of the year, but neither actor or actress was the actress of the year. But the director, remember you got talent, you got organization, you got leadership. The director is in the movie that wins movie of the year 80% of the time. Let me say that again. The directors are in the movie that wins movie of the year 80% of the time. So this year, Parasite wins movie of the year, and the director is the director of the year. Oh, take a breath. What does all this mean? We have to create the right organization. The team, the organization is more important than any of the individuals. And when we create that right organization, we succeed, much more successful. So the organization is taking individuals and melding them to teams. It's taking technical skills and building social skills. In our research on organizations over the last 40 years, what are the key capabilities of a successful organization? 25 or 30 years ago, we said it's all about talent. You gotta have the right competence, the right workforce, the right people. Then we said it's about customers. Are the talent and the people we have serving our customers? And we correlated talent and customer. Then we said it's about innovation and breakthrough. Innovation, breakthrough, invention, doing new things. Then we said it's collaboration and teamwork. A few years ago, culture was the word of the year. Today, it's agility. What does my organization have to be good at? Now, you can't have agility without the culture, without the collaboration, without innovation, but the evolution of the critical organizational capabilities is quickly moving to agility. And the answer why is really simple, because the world is changing. I could go back. The world is changing so quickly. 12 weeks ago, I would never have dreamed that I'd have the privilege of doing a workshop with a thousand people in Indonesia sitting in my home. It would not have been even remotely possible. Today, it's not only possible, we're doing it. And it's not the same as being in person, but it's getting better. So, take a deep breath. Here's one thing I hope you walk away with. How can I, as a board or senior business executive, help companies, my, uh, help my company, or help create a more agile organization? Number one, recognize that organizational agility is the key to market success. If I don't manage my organization and move quickly, I will not succeed. That's it. That's the first premise. And the test of my commitment and recognition, am I, as a board member, and am I as a business leader or an HR leader spending time on agility? So I've answered my first two bullets. Take a deep breath, I've gone quickly. I, uh, I think I'm gonna do one more bullet and then I'll see if there are any questions, maybe three or four questions, Gusti, just to break up this presentation. But let me do one more piece. I've talked about ideas with impact with the boards. 
we can have financial, strategic, and technological, but we have to build an organization. Digital transformation that's happening all around us, the corona crisis and a future crisis in Indonesia requires discovery of new organizational capabilities, particularly agility. So what does agility mean? Let me talk about this, then we'll take a break and see if there are a couple of questions. You know, I started going through my uh, books and readings, and I started looking at all the terms that are used to define agility. Change, transformation, renewal, reimagination, reinvention, grit, speed, revival, shift. You know, you probably got some of your own terms that I don't have. I looked at some of the books. Agility is strategic shift. Agility, the agility factor, build to change. Great book. The Age of Agile. There's a new book coming out on learning agility that uh, has, I think, 17 chapters. that uh, just went to the printer in May, and I don't have that. They don't have their cover yet. There is a lot of stuff. Now, remember, remember, I made $11. I made $11.85 by being a taxonomist. Remember what a taxonomist does. A taxonomist says, take something really complex and make it simple. So look at all the complexity. There are books out there about learning and reinvention. What is a simple, simple definition of agility? And here it is. Agility means four things to create a future. Agility is not focused on the past. It's very nice to focus on, look where I've been. It's creating a future that anticipates what can be. The future is not bleak, it's an opportunity. I think a lot of times we look at agility as resilience. Resilience is often overcoming the past, grit. Agility is creating a future that I can anticipate. And I hope this doesn't offend, I'll use a religious example that I think would apply across many different religions. Some prophets tell their people they're gonna to go to hell if they don't repent. Other prophets tell their people they can go to heaven and they give them a pathway to get there. I think agility is the second. It's creating a vision, a sense of the future. And here's the opportunity that future provides. Number three, you gotta move quick. Agility means speed. You got to move quick. You can't wait. You can't be the, 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 the fourth follower. What they find in uh, retail and manufacturing and consumer goods, the first mover often gets 40 to 50% of a market. And you got to learn. Failure is an opportunity to learn. I should have brought the pillow. I made my wife a pillow that says, failure is an opportunity to learn. Um, and she said, is that about our marriage? And I said, no, our marriage is terrific. But failure allows me to learn. That's it. Of all of these complex ideas, many of which could have an individual book written, and I love these books. They're great books. There's other books coming. By the way, if you don't like these four, you can tweak them. But try to say from all that stuff, there's four messages. Focus on the future. Envision opportunity. Adapt quickly and learn always so that we win, we thrive, we succeed in the changing world. That's what I mean by agility. Now, I'm going to lay out one more thing, and this is going to be a tape. You know what? I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Before I go to my one more thing, let me, uh, let me say, Gusti, are there any questions or comments? And let's try to do maybe three at this point so that we don't get distracted. I still have more to go. Uh, okay. But if there are any questions, let's, uh, let me turn to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, untuk para peserta, uh, bisa bertanya dengan bahasa Inggris atau dengan bahasa Indonesia, and I will translate it. Thank you. So, How, am I saying yeah. your name right? Is it Gusti? Uh, yeah. No. no, say it better. Hayu. Actually, you can call me Hayu. Hayu? Yes. Wow, I would never have gotten that from the name I saw. So, Hayu, <laughs> thank you. I apologize. Hayu, so I'm go, I go by Dave. That's very easy. Okay. Hi. Um, okay. I I uh, I think you answered this uh, very uh, this question very briefly. But uh, earlier you mentioned why agility is so important because when uh, the environment changes, that we also have to change. But the problem is uh, this is a question from Bapak Heru Widiatmanti. 
So uh, he's asking about uh, multiple generations in uh, board of directors, which actually uh, still happens a lot in a lot of the state-owned um, companies in Indonesia. And uh, not only multiple generation, but quite a lot also in the older generations. So when you acknowledge, uh, you have, first you have to acknowledge that there is a change uh, coming and then we need to change. So he's asking how to quickly be, to build awareness of this agility competency. How can we uh, convince the board of directors that change uh, agility is needed? First of all, thank you. I'm one of the old boards of directors, so I'm probably older than anyone else. So I appreciate the comment. And I really enjoy state-owned enterprises. They have the unique combination of private and public. I think we need to look outside to change inside. If we try to change for the sake of change, it's not going to happen. And so what I was trying to go through is to say, what's changing in the technology world? Look at all of those industries that have gone through change. Every industry, transportation, retail, healthcare, education. And if I'm a member of the board of directors, I want to bring the outside pace of change inside the company so that I help people see that the pace of change is so dynamic and so prevalent. How might I do that? Go collect data, find out who our new customers are, what the customers expect, who are our new competitors, how do they compete with us? What are the technology changes that will be shaping our industry? And try to go get information. The other thing I'd encourage board members to do is not only uh, digital quantitative information, but qualitative information. And by qualitative, I'll give an example. A friend of mine is the head of research and development at Nike, the footwear company. He has 600 employees who do R&D for Nike, and they have statistics and body measurements and athletic gear. Four days a year, John Hoke, the head of R&D at Nike, wanders around a city, and it could be Jakarta, it could be London, it could be New York City, it could be Tokyo. What he does that day is what's called unstructured data, qualitative data. He becomes an anthropologist. He observes. He tries to see what people are doing. So if he's in New York City, he may get up at five o'clock or six and go to Central Park where people are running. He may go to health clubs. He may go to uh, stores that are selling products. He's trying to get a sense of what people are doing that is not yet in the statistics. Why do I say all that? How you, I encourage board members to have statistical data, customers, competitors, technology changes but also be exposed to non-statistical observational data. The information experts tell me 20% of the world's data is in statistics, and I like statistics. 80% of the world's data is in observation. And so as a board member, I and my management team should be observing what's coming so that I recognize what got us here won't get us there. A great quote by Marshall Goldsmith. That's a long answer. I'll try to be more precise. Thank you, Hayu. Okay, thank you. Um, Two more questions. If okay. We have. Uh, another interesting question is from Bapak Mouli Deriska Dewantoro. Uh, how and where uh, the point to start creating an agile organization? But if I'm not mistaken, you will cover that later. I will cover that in just a moment. I will cover that. Okay, in so I will just take a note that we uh, make sure we answer that. I hope. Uh, okay. Another one is how to drive and sustain agility in the long run. You know what? I'm going to move on because I'm going to answer okay. both of those questions. Okay, good. Um, let me tell you where I hope you are now. I hope where you are now is you're saying, how can I as a board member help create a more effective organization? One, I recognize that agility matters. It's something I should spend time on. It's something I should be focused on in order to be successful. And I have to make sure that I pay attention to agility. So now let's say there's four definitions of agility, creating a future, anticipating opportunity, adapting. This is the roadmap. This is the map and my phone is ringing. Let me turn my phone off. I should have done that before. That's the new technology age. This phone is now not ringing. 
let me tell you the mistake that we sometimes make on your second and third question. The second question is, let's go create organizational agility. Let's create a team called a scrum team, a rugby team. And we go create this team. And it doesn't get sustained. Third question, why not? Because agility is complex. In the middle is the definition. Create a future, anticipate opportunity, adapt, learn. But we, be, we believe, and we found in our research, there's four dimensions of agility. One is organization, where the question was asked. Great question. How do we create a more agile organization? That's great. Flexible, agile teams. I'll talk about that. But if that organization isn't connected to strategy, and where are we going and how do we compete, it won't be sustained. If it's not connected to leadership behavior, remember leaders tie individuals and organizations together, it won't be sustained. If it's not connected to individual ingredients, if I have bad ingredients, I'm not going to have good banana bread. I've got to have as a board member an overall roadmap of what agility looks like. And there's four parts, three parts of that roadmap. In the middle is agility, the definitions. And again, if you don't like these four, you can tweak them, but they capture that work. It's focused on the future. It sees opportunity about what's next. It adapts quickly and it learns. Then the second piece of agility is where it occurs, strategy, organization, leaders, and individuals. And the third piece of agility is what sustains it or institutionalizes it, our HR practices. Agility is woven into the people we hire, pay, train, develop, communicate. I believe there are three fours of agility. Definition, where, and, and, and what we do to sustain it, how we sustain it. Now, what does that mean? Board members or senior business leaders, you have a stewardship to build an agility or an agile organization. I propose that you begin to do this very simple six item test. What's the pace of environmental change in your business? Zero to one to 10, low to high. My bet is most businesses are in that seven, eight, nine or 10 range with digital, with coronavirus, with social unrest in America. Second, how are we doing on strategic agility? How clear are we about where and how we compete? One to 10. Third, how are we doing on organizational agility? How agile is our organization able to change its culture, its way of working? One to 10. How are we doing with leaders? How do our individual leaders and leadership throughout do? One to 10. How do each of those individuals throughout the company do? One to 10. And how well do our HR practices around people, performance, work, drive agility and sustain it. We've worked with a lot of companies and as a board, our job is to keep a simple, simple assessment that keeps the management team focused on agility. And this assessment will give you a visual of how well we're doing. With that in mind, I've just given you two more outcomes of today's discussion. Number one, again, we recognize agility is the key to success. Number two, we define four dimensions of agility. Focus on the future, anticipate opportunity, move quickly, adapt quickly, and learn always. And now I encourage you as a board member, senior leader, perform an organizational agility audit. Find out how you're doing. If you don't like these six questions exactly, you can create your own. And there are, there are sponsors who will help you create that. But find out the baseline and don't do an audit. I got to say this again, with only one dimension. Don't just look at strategy. Don't just look at leadership. Don't just look at a few people or just the organization. Look at the integrated audit that allows you to create agility. I've covered three things. And again, I'm repeating this over and over again. I know... Uh, in the, the, many of the sponsors of this session are exceptional at communications. And I'm repeating many times the message. Board members, you and senior leaders have financial, strategic, technology, and organizational leadership. Why does agility matter? Digital transformation, the corona crisis, and other crises require the discovery of new capabilities around agility. So what does agility mean? Four things. Focus forward on the future, anticipate opportunity, adapt quickly, 
And number four, learn always. So once we've done this audit about these four dimensions in this picture, we can now begin to get a set of tools where agility applies. What I'm going to do is give you a couple of tools for each of these four. So I'm going to give you a couple of tools for strategy, a couple of tools for organization, a couple of tools for leadership, and a couple of tools for individual. You can get much more than that. You can dive deep into the slides there. We work with that in our firm and others. But what I want to do is say, wherever I, I, I see I need to improve, I can improve. Let's start with strategy. How do I create strategic agility? Recognize in my organization, again, I do zero to 10 kind of moving up. We used to do strategic planning, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. I put SWAT. I'm sorry, I should have spelled it out. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. What's my one to three year plan? Then we did alignment. How do I diagnose and align my systems? Then we did strategic capabilities. Now we're doing strategic agility. Does my organization transform, disrupt, reinvent, and rediscover itself quickly? And even, not even, perhaps more than ever, public sector organizations have to do that. So how do I do it? We've identified five critical things, and I'm not going to take you through this in detail. You can back it up. You can go to some of the books we've done and your sponsors. I don't want to be the industry expert, number one. I want to shape the industry. In strategy, I don't want to be an expert that knows more. I want to be the creator and the reputation. I don't want to follow others. I want to get out there and shape what a new industry can be. As I interface with customers, I don't anymore want market share. I don't want to say who we are. I want to go after market opportunity. Anticipate the trends. See an opportunity. There are some who moved into the digital space sooner than others. They anticipated, they saw. I want to go outside in. I want to create my strategy not by who we are, but by what our identity should be in the marketplace. Competition. I don't want to beat my competitors. That tells me I'm benchmarking against competitors. I want to leapfrog. I want to move ahead. I don't want to have an isolated product. I want to converge platforms of products and move. And my strategic, process is, my strategic process is not an event. Let's go off site for a day. It's a process, real time, responsive, constantly adapting. Now, I could spend hours or a half a day just on this slide. But what I've tried to give a board member is to say, if I'm trying to create strategic agility, Recognize the evolution of, a, of strategy from planning to alignment to capability to agility. These are five transitions that I as a board member should encourage my business team to do. Are we shaping our industry? Are we going after market opportunity, not just share? Are we outside in in our thinking? Are we seeing the value that others might get from what we do? Are we going ahead of competition? Are we converging? Are we building platforms? And do we have a process to involve people? Let's go to organization. This is one a lot of people worry about. Do I have organizational agility? To describe this one, I'm going to tell a few stories. This is a story that's in our book. Um, and uh, I'm going to hold up the book. Here's the book. I saw it in your, your promotion. Uh, and I should say here, Arthur Young from China, who is the thought leader. I am following him on this book. But in the book, this story is the first story in the book. Um, so it's the first story in the book. A mother goes to the beach with two of her sons and her mother. The two boys, eight and 10, get in the ocean and they're caught in a riptide. Now, I've never been caught in a riptide. I'm sure there are some of the thousand people in the audience in Indonesia with all of your beautiful beaches who've been caught in a riptide. I've been told it's frightening. The two boys are being pulled out in the ocean. The mother jumps in to save them. The grandmother jumps in to save them. Three or four people from the beach jump in, and suddenly there's about 80 people trying to save these seven or eight people in the riptide. Notice what happened. The 80 people joined arms. They joined hands. They joined linked arms. They saved those people. 
you know, I've told this story probably 80 to 100 times and I still feel the emotion. Mark, um, Michael Phelps is the greatest swimmer in Olympic history, 20 gold medals. He couldn't have saved those eight people. But what happened on this beach was very powerful. They created an organization. It's an organization that had a very clear purpose to save those people. It came together, it collaborated, it innovated, it acted with agility. They didn't focus on hierarchy. They didn't set a bunch of rules. Ooh, before we go connect arms, who's gonna be in charge? Who goes first? Who's tallest? Who's shortest? Who swims? No, they acted, they moved, and they saved those people. What a great story. What a great story. So Arthur and I decided, who are companies who've done what that, that small organization of 80 people did at scale? Because the state-owned enterprises in Indonesia are large. Some are small, some are very large. We looked at eight companies. We looked at Google, Amazon, and Facebook in the United States, North America. We looked at Supercell in Europe. We looked at Tencent, Alibaba, Didi, Huawei in China. Why these eight companies? Because they're amazing. This was a few months ago. This is the year they were founded, and these are the eight companies. Their average age was 1997, 22 years old. By the way, 22 years is not very old for a company. I'm betting some of the Indonesian SOEs are older than that. How many employees? These companies in 20 years average 158,000, and it's even more today. This was, I think, last September, August 19. What's the market value? An indicator of success, 436 billion US dollars. Whoa. By the way, the small company on there is Supercell. If you took it out, the average number of employees would go up, the market value would go up, it only had 213 employees. You could count them by name. But look at its market value, 10 billion. These companies did something special. They turned that little, that quick story of, of the people saved on the beach into agility at scale. Now, what we discovered is lots of people have studied these companies. They give them tons of names. And my bet is many of your state-owned enterprises and other firms in Indonesia, you talk about being a network or boundaryless. We did a book on that. Or ambidextrous or lattice or horizontal or exponential or agile or holacracy or amoeba or learning. You get all these names and ideas that have been bubbling up. Now, remember, my PhD is around taxonomy. I love to simplify. So what Arthur and I did is we took all of those ideas that others have studied, we looked at these eight companies, and we called it a new organizational form. Market-oriented, focused on the marketplace, outside in, ecosystem. And the connection of parts that are distinct and separate. By the way, I should tell you our publisher didn't like that name. She said, it's not cute, it's not creative, it's not sexy. And we said, look at all the creative terms, amoeba, holacracy, ambidextrous, lattice, horizontal, boundaryless. We don't need another creative name. What we need is a summary of all of that work grounded in eight great companies. And that's what we created. We identified six factors that create the market-oriented ecosystem. Let me quickly describe them and how agility is the essence of this organization. As always, it starts with the environment, what's happening outside, and the strategy. We've talked about that. Then it starts with the capability. Agility is what we're trying to create. It moves to the structure, and we build a structure with a, a platform, a hub, and a spoke, and a connection. It then moves to governance, and how do we build the right culture? I'll talk about that. And then it moves to leadership. We have identified, and again, this book is there if you want to see it. We've identified those six features of this agile organization. And in the, in the book, we have, we have uh, and by the way, that's the same chart that's in the book. Uh, those are the features. We've identified what we do to create this agile organization that wins in the marketplace. <sighs> 
I think it's time for a story. So let me tell a story and then I'll go on to the next few pieces. I think an organization that wins in the marketplace has to adapt to its outside customers, the environment, the strategy. Our son, um, oh, I'm gonna show family pictures for a minute. This is our lovely son. Well, this is our family. That's uh, us with our grandchildren. Uh, that's a lovely wife. That's ugly grandfather. That's children. Our son finished his PhD. We were so proud of him. And so that's our son. And we said, Michael, what do you want for a gift? And he said, I want to go to Disney. Now, I don't know if many of you in Indonesia have had the opportunity to go to a Disney theme park. They're exciting. They're cool. At the time, our son had four children, four young daughters. I want to take my daughters to Disney as my graduation gift. As parents, we said, okay. And then our other daughter said, I want to go to Disney with my two kids. And our other daughter said, I want to go to Disney with my two kids. Now, and I just printed this today. I looked it up on my phone knowing I was going to talk with you. So suddenly we show up at Disney with 16 of us. Notice there's Disney. There's old grandfather, not very happy. There's beautiful son who finished his PhD. And look at the beautiful grandchildren. 16 of us are at Disney. <coughs> and a woman comes out. Oh, I've got to tell the other part of the story. Our son said, to have the full Disney experience, you have to stay on the property. You can take a monorail. And, and I said to my son, I said, what it means to stay on property is you get a soap bar that has Disney mouse ears carved in it. And they charge you three times as much money for the room. Now, remember, we've got four rooms. We've got to get a lot of rooms. It's very expensive. And I said to Mike, our son, I will go buy soap and I'll carve the ears and we'll save money. And he said, Dad, you don't understand Disney. And I said, you're right. It's costing me money. And it's also, you don't see it here, it is hot, it's humid. We're going to walk seven or eight kilometers, 10,000 steps, and we've got three children in diapers. And a woman comes up and she says, oh, what a lovely family. This is the happiest place on earth. And I looked at her and I said, not for me. I'm not going to buy a car this year because we're going to Disney and I'm going to sweat all day long. This is tough. So we go through the day and I'm grumpy. I'm grouchy. Let me tell you what happened. We walk into a room and out walks Cinderella. Cinderella. And I, I just printed this today. There is Cinderella and our granddaughters who are eight, eight, and six. And look at that. They look up at me and they say, Grandpa, she's real. There's Cinderella. She can touch them and hug them. And Grandpa, she's beautiful. And Grandpa, we love you. Thank you so much. And I'm going, oh, no. And I go, oh, no, because I know I'm going to have to go back to Disney again and again and again so that those granddaughters have that same experience. Disney is brilliant. They took this grandfather who's grouchy, and they made me one of the happiest men in the world because my granddaughters looked at me and said, Grandpa, we love you. Now, take a step back. What does Disney do to build that agile organization? They know the environment and customers they're working with. They're trying to serve our granddaughters so that they serve me. They have a strategy. Guess what Disney did after we went? They kept sending my granddaughter's notices who are eight years old, take a Disney cruise. <sighs> Suddenly, last summer, we took a Disney cruise. I still don't have a new car because that cruise costs more than a car. They build this agility in, they adapt, they build a structure that allows them to build Disney across all pieces, the theme park, the cruise ship, the, the movies, the books, and their culture in number five, their governance, their culture is tied to me, the customer. And they build that into everybody who's a leader. My job, as a board member is to create strategic agility. I'll just, I love that story. I think it's a fun story and it's a true story. And I only, I, that's the first time I've ever shown that picture. I should have got approval from my granddaughters today, but it's, it's so fun. You got to get strategic agility. 
where and how do we compete? You got to build organizational agility. Where and how do we create agility? Disney's done that. Um, all the companies we study, Tencent, Huawei have done it. You got to build leadership agility. We discovered that there are five skills of leadership. We did a book called Leadership Code. Leaders have got to have a good strategy. Where am I going? Got to know where I'm going. They got to execute. How do I get things done? They got to manage talent and they got to build tomorrow's talent. There's five things leaders need to do. And in the middle, four things is personal proficiency, character, trust. Those are the five basic skills of good leadership. Strategy, shape the future, where am I going? Execution, get things to happen. How do I get things done? Talent, how do I engage people today? Human capital, how do I build the future? And personal. I'm gonna give you a test, just to give you a kind of break as we do these webinars. How many of these numbers from one to 45 can you find in a row? And I'll give you 45 seconds, starting with one that's at the top left. Go, how many can you find in a row? Twenty seconds. Nothing. Five, four, three, two, Nothing. one. Go ahead. Somebody had a comment. No. How many did you find? It'd be fun to test. Let me tell you what we've learned. Sometimes you need a framework to make things happen. I'm gonna ask you to do it again. I put four lines in this exercise. How many can you find in a row? Start at the top left. One, two, three, across the top. Four, five, six in the middle. Seven, eight, nine, across the bottom. Then 10, 11, 12. And what we have is a framework for leadership. And we've discovered that the basic framework for leadership has five basic features. Strategy, execution, talent, human capital, and personal. In the world of agility, there's some things we have to add for leaders. And the next generation leaders in strategy have to create information asymmetry to find out what really matters in the world. At Disney, what really matters is the grandfather's commitment to his granddaughters. To harness uncertainty and not be scared by it. Execution down at the bottom right. You got to build the right culture. Disney built the right culture focused on, our, on the guest. Provide guidance, both analytics and subjective. Talent manager, you've got to personalize responses. Really listen to each other to build agility. Be empathetic. And empathy is one of the keys to agility. Human capital, you've got to empower others and create safety and personal. You got to be transparent. In that picture, we've identified things that you should do to build agility. As board members, I put this in and I'll do it quickly. The most critical thing a board does is pick a CEO. So here's some of the things about leadership succession. Investing time. Number two, have a definition. And I just gave you some of the elements of what a new CEO should look at. Do an assessment of the CEO today and candidates against these dimensions that I just laid out. Invest in developing my CEO today. Build number five, building the senior team. Attending to our next generation leaders. Building talent and managing transition. Let me take a breath. I'm gonna hit individual agility and then I'm gonna take a deep breath and summarize where we are and then hit HR quickly and we'll have time for questions. I will be done in about seven minutes with my presentation. Uh, so that we'll have 20 minutes for questions. We've got to help people be agile. If we hire people who aren't agile or curious, we're never going to have agility. By the way, it's turning the evening where I live and the sun is now shining on my face. So I'm not glowing because of some divine intervention. I'm glowing because the sun is shining on my face. We've learned that helping people be agile is four basic steps. One, know yourself. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What do I want? Number two, have a clear image of how others perceive me. Manage my self-talk. Number three, 
have a mindset of growth and resilience and adaptation. And number four, learn to navigate paradox. Learn to live in a world of tension and difficulty. Those four things can be done for every employee in our company. Whoa, take a deep breath. Oh, maybe you can hear the sirens outside our house. Uh, just to bring you into America, you may have seen it in the newspapers. They're having protests because of the racial strife. And right outside where we are is one of the streets where some of those protests have been occurring. So often there's sirens that come just before people march up the street. They're not dangerous marches. This is not at risk. In fact, last night our daughter said, uh, who lives next door, they came to the intersection in the road and they blocked the intersection and then they turned on loud music and everybody started to dance. And that was the protest. So, I, it, by the way, if you see me get up and start dancing, it's because I'm being moved by the protest. I'm, I'm not going to do that. My dancing would not be a positive thing for any of you. How can I, as a board member, help create an agile organization? One, recognize agility as a key to success. Two, define four dimensions of agility. And we define the four, focus forward, anticipating, moving quickly, learning. Number three, perform an audit of agility on all the dimensions of agility. Number four, guide and create improvements in strategic agility, organizational agility, leadership agility, and individual agility. And now I come to number five, number, and I've just gone through that. How do I institutionalize agility and make it last? And my answer is through human resource practices. I spend an enormous amount of time, about half my time with human resource professionals. I am devoted to the human resource agenda that drives sustainable change. A lot of times human resource people are not playing in the strategic world where we need them to play. So here's the takeaway. There are four domains of human resource practices that will sustain agility, people. Buying people, hiring the right people, build, train the people, borrow, access people through, through um, contracts or, or remote at work, boost, promote people, bounce, remove people, or bind. In fact, somebody has said to me once, what's the most critical human resource practices for helping a company succeed? And I'm going to tell you what it is. Place your lowest performing employee in, a compet in your competitor. And tell that low-performing employee that he or should do should keep doing the same work. Just do it for a competitor. <laughs> By the way, it's a joke, but it's also true. Because if I pick my competitor's employees, they're not going to win. Manage my people. Manage performance on agility. Set standards for agility. Ensure consequences. Do feedback. Communicate about agility. Our sponsors are exceptional at learning and communication and organize work and processes and teams to drive agility. Those four sets of HR practices, people, performance, communication, and work, can be used to drive all four types of agility. And again, I'm trying to give you some tools that you could go back and use. You've done your assessment as a board member and you're saying, we need to do a better job at, at leadership agility. Which people practices, number three, seven, 11, or 15, could I work on to build leadership agility? Is it around people, hiring, promoting, training? Is it around accountability and performance management? Is it around communication or work? What could I do to build and sustain leadership agility? Or if my demand is strategic agility, that column, I could look at one, five, nine, and 13 and say, what can I do about people, performance, communication, work to drive strategic agility? Whoa, I'm almost done. Let me go back to my very simple question, and I know I've covered a lot. I know I've covered a lot. The good news is, as I said, I've been with Suwardi Lewis in, in sessions in Indonesia. This is, one, this is some of the brightest, most talented colleagues I've ever worked with. And I know that, th that these ideas reinforce what most of you are doing. But here's my question. How can I, as a board or business leader, create a more agile organization? Number one, recognize it matters. Number two, four dimensions. Number three, do an overall audit. Number five, based on the audit, improve strategic agility, organizational agility, leadership, or individual. And number five, invest in people, performance, communication, and work. HR tools 
to institutionalize agility. That leads me to the final slide. Who's responsible for this? I think we have two responsibilities as board members and as senior leaders. One, to be a more agile leader. People do what you do. And part of learning to lead is to model. Uh, two quick stories, one non-business. When our children were young, and, and they're not young in any of my pictures at this point, we used to tell our children, and I'm sure if you have children six, seven, eight, or nine, you've said the same thing, clean your room, clean your room. And they'd hassle and they'd clean. When they turned 11, 12, or 13, they'd sometimes look at us and we'd say, Michael or Monica, clean your room. And they'd look back and say, Dad, your room's a mess. You clean your room first. <laughs> Leaders who are hypocrites are not leading. If we want, as a board member or senior leader, to build agility, we have to model it. I was working with a CEO who unfortunately passed away, but many will have known his name. He was iconic, Jack Welch. He was the CEO of General Electric, one of the most powerful and successful leaders in history. He discovered and he knew that the way you treat your people will have an impact on your business success. It'll affect your customers, your financial results, your market value. And if you participate with your employees, they'll be more committed and they'll lead to success. So here's what he said one day. He said, Dave, help me as a consultant. I am gonna demand that my, peop my leaders practice participative management. Now let me say that again and see if you see the flaw. I am going to demand that my leaders practice participative management. And then I said, are you nuts? You can't demand participation. You've got to model it. You've got to be it. Because if you demand participation, you're the same leadership hypocrite who says, clean your room when your children say, dad, your room's a mess. Every one of us who's listening to this call, the, the, the thousands who are listening, we need to be the leader that others will follow in agility that I've talked about tonight. Second, we've got to build better leadership in others. The ultimate test of a leader is to empower others to create their leadership agenda. If I can help others build their leadership agenda, we are gonna be more successful. Let me end with this story that captures it for me. I uh, have the privilege of the last two years of working with a, uh, a woman who's the president of a university where I live, large university, 40,000 students. Let me share her story, is this concept of building better leadership. She was born in the Philippines. She's Filipino, I'm quite large and she's quite small. She was born in a hut. Her parents didn't read, they didn't uh, write, they, they were not academic at all. At age six, she went to school, sponsored by the Catholics. She sat, she sat in the back corner because she couldn't read and she couldn't write and she couldn't do math. Now I'll go quickly. By the end of the year, she's sitting in the front row right in the middle as the best six-year-old in the class. Through high school, she's the number one student. She goes to the university and graduates as the number one student of a 30,000 person university. She goes to Harvard in the United States and MIT, gets joint graduate degrees, master's PhD, speaks six languages, and is just brilliant. Works in the United States Embassy in Russia, which was one of her areas of study. Runs Microsoft in Asia uh, for a number of years, is the leader and, and thought leader in Microsoft Asia and becomes the president of a university in the United States two years ago. She is brilliant. I don't think I've met a more brilliant leader anywhere in my life. And she has an incredible story. She's on video and you can see her in the Philippines revisiting her village and now running, working in the embassy, Microsoft, the university. And here's what everyone says. Dr. Tumanez, tell your story. You have a brand, you have an incredible story. Tell your story. Here's how I've coached her. Dr. Tumanez, do not tell your story. <laughs> your job as a leader is to empower other people to create their story. And their story will not be your story. Nobody is gonna do what you did coming from, and by the way, I'm so impressed with your story. So we go for a little walk, we meet people, and, and she meets a young woman who's 32 years old a mother who has three children whose husband is dying of cancer. 
and she meets with this woman and says, how can we as a university help you create your story? And this young woman, a few years later, when her husband has passed away, graduates. And she says, because of what you've done, Dr. Tuman, as at this university, I now have my brand, my identity. I'm not a university president, but I'm caring for my children. Boy, I beg of us as leaders throughout Indonesia, be a great leader, build better leadership by getting others to be their leadership and empower them. I've given you six bullets. Let me um, finish with these six bullets. How can I create a more agile organization? I think I'm gonna do it, oops, I'm gonna do it here. Recognize that agility is a key to find the dimensions, perform an audit, number three. Number four, make investments and improvements, strategic organization leadership, invest in my HR to sustain it, and then finally and most critical, take responsibility to be a more agile leader and to build agile leadership in others. Whoa, hey you, hey you? Hi you. Hi you. <laughs> Hi you. I'm so sorry. Hey to you too. <laughs> hey to you too. I've covered a lot of material. Yes, you did. Um, I think we'll do questions and then I need one minute at the end. So I'm going to okay. ask, so let's take questions. It's uh, time for the questions that we can try to respond to. Okay. Uh, hold on. Uh, can you click the answer live so that maybe, no, 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 no. That one, uh, th there's the button answer live. Uh, where do I click? You, okay. I, I was sorry. I was talking to the host. So let oh. me just read it to you. So this is from Pa Agus, a group head of HCM uh, PT Berdikari. Uh, the performance of an organization will be optimal, optimal when there is a harmony between the organization strategic with human capital. But when the human capital is not aligned with strategic organization, it makes turbulence organization. So it will be difficult to build agility. Oh, so he's asking how to drive agility in turbulent organization. I would, uh, and by the way, I love the question and I'm gonna give you a different kind of answer. You have strategy, where are we going? You have people, who helps us get there? What we have found to build harmony is not against a strategy, but between the employee and the customer. And so what I would encourage you to think about is to strategy is often a mirror. And I look in a mirror and I see what I should do. Change the mirror to a window. Look through the strategy to the outside customer and say to the outside customer, what is it we need to be known for and good at? Think of my Disney story. I mean, it's, it's a, such a cool story. Disney did not build their human capital against their strategy. They built it against their customer experience. Disney wants this family, wherever my picture is, they want this family to have an experience by looking at their daughters, looking at, I don't know if that's Snow White or Cinderella. I think that's Cinderella. They want their daughters. And so what I'd encourage you to do is to say, I'm going to create harmony or connection or unity between the customer experience outside and the employee experience inside. What that means is every time we define an internal set of values, innovation, tell me what that means to the customer. Every time we make a customer brand promise, reliability, what does that mean to the employee? And when we connect the outside customer with the inside employee, we create a harmony and that's where strategy becomes a byproduct of that harmony. So I, when we go in to define a company's harmony or, or strategic agenda, we often start with customers. Who are our key customers? What do we want them to know us for? How do we now make that real to the employees inside the company? Okay, so if I, uh, if I may uh, kind of rephrase that, so don't focus on how uh, the condition of your internal organization, right? So yeah. see the customer first and then uh, see uh, the environment that your employees are in and then whether you want to move it forward or not. May I quote you on that? That was brilliantly said. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, uh, do you, sorry, did I cut you? Do you have anything else to add? No, that's good. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next I one. I know there are 60 some questions. We won't get yes. to all of them. So no, I know yeah. you'll consolidate some. Thank you. Yes. Uh, 
sorry, which one? Uh, the host is helping me on picking the, the questions. Thank you. Uh, how, uh, this is from Pa Guntur Priyadu. How to overcome the resistance from the employees if our organization want to adapt the change? Do you have some tips with that? Go back to, I didn't get the third word, how to? How to overcome the resistance from employees. Good, good. good. Often we see three types of resistance. Technical, they don't have the skills. So give the employee the skills. And skills is in some ways the easiest. Give them training and ability. The second resistance is political. They don't believe they have influence. Give the employees a chance to influence, to make a difference. And third is cultural. That's the mindset. It's the thought process that they can have an impact. And so what we see is overcome technical resistance with skill building, training, development, give you the skills. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the increasing skills are not technical, they're soft skills. In conference after conference, it's not learn, a, learn how to do a balance sheet or an income statement. It's learn how to set goals, build relationships, work with others. Political, give people access to influence. And cultural, give people the mindset, the psychological safety, the chance that they can, in fact, make a difference. Those are the three things that we overcome for resistance, technical, political, and cultural. Okay. Uh, I hope that answers the question from Pa uh, Guntur. Because, uh, of course, uh, a natural human reaction to change is the first thing will be defensive and how will it affect my job, right? L let me. Uh, hey, you. No. Yes. Hey, Hi you. I got it right. <laughs> Hi, you. <laughs> Hi, you. Hi, you. Hi, you. Thank you. It, not hey, you, it's how you. Um, let me, let me do a stupid illustration. If I were to say to you, I am going to send you $1,000 because I've enjoyed working with you so much this evening, would you resist that? No. By the way, no. 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 We resist change when it's not good for it. I, if somebody were to say to me, I'm going to give you a magic water that if you drink it, you will immediately lose 20 kilos. I wouldn't resist oh, that. I drink, I drink, I drink, you don't need to lose 20 kilos. I drink three of these. We resist change when we don't understand it, when it creates okay. fear, when it's seen in, in our world as, as something that's negative. And so our job as leaders, technical, give people information, give people knowledge, politically, let them influence, culturally, create emotional safety. And, and I, now having said that, not everybody's going to accept change. I mean, yes. it just, it's not going to happen. Yes. But in fact, let me, let me share one other piece on that because it's such a key point. In almost every change effort I've been around, I've been around a lot because I'm so old, 20% of our employees and leaders get it. So if I'm a board of directors and I look at the leadership team in my companies, 20% are exceptional. They're agile. They're creative. 20% will never get it. No matter what we do, they're not going to get it. And 60% are probably in the middle. Okay. My advice to leaders and board members, ignore both 20s. The 20% who get it, they don't need your help. In fact, I see some boards making a mistake. They go work with the 20% who are good and say, we made them good. I'm now going to do something really fun. You didn't make them good. Your mother did. And there's my mother sitting there watching. She's 92 years old. And she's always wondered what I do for a living. So if you look up, you will see my mother <laughs> sitting. Hi, mom. They wave. That's my mother. She wanted to know what I'm doing for a living. So I said, you can watch me. And my mother gave me everything I have that's good. And my father, who's here on the couch in his chair, don't work with a good 20. Don't waste your time with the bottom 10 to 20. I know that's horrible. Go for the 60. Okay. Okay. <laughs> My mother is not overwhelmingly happy that I just showed her picture <laughs> to a thousand people in Indonesia. So, mom, I'm so, so okay. <laughs> uh, how many more questions uh, do you think we can do? It's what do you think? Nice. Maybe three more? Three okay. more? Okay, let's give it a try. Uh, hold on. Okay, so this is from Pa Zulfikar. In terms of agile organization, most of organizations start thinking about rebuilding their current long-term strategy and remapping their focus to achieve the agility. 
but a lot of them get confused about taking the first step. Uh, even though you explained oh, much about the step-by-step -step to do that, could you prioritize a few steps that senior leader could, should do as a quick win? And the quick, uh, by the way, the, what a great question. I should have done more with that. That's really helpful. I like to think of all the things we could do out of that agility audit, strategically, organizationally. And I look at two questions. So I, I like to build a grid. One is um, potential impact, low to high. Okay. Uh, some things will have high impact, changing the compensation system. That's going to have high impact. Some things will have no impact. Uh, well, I'll say it. Right now in America, there's a lot of racial strife. If you watch American news, you see it. Protests and other things. Companies are sending out proclamations. We proclaim that we're justice. Let me be blunt. That's not going to have much impact. I mean, I just... No impact. I, I hope that's not being critical, but it is. It's honest. The other axis is ease of implementability from hard to easy. For example, compensation has high impact, but it is really hard to implement. And so it's going to take time. We want to look for things that have high impact and are relatively easy to implement. That might be, for example, in the racial strife, a town hall meeting. That's got relatively high impact. It might be um, some personal decisions around uh, biases and unconscious biases, changing policies. At a university, for example, um, there's racial words that I don't want to say publicly that are that are very bad for the for the for the group. The university that I work with just put in place a policy: if any faculty or administrator uses one of those words that are inappropriate, they are immediately fired. And if any student uses one of those words in a public, you can't control private thoughts, but you can control. If any student uses one of those words in a public forum, they are immediately suspended and expelled. That's got pretty high impact and it's pretty easy to implement. What you want to find on those two dimensions are impact and implementability. Okay. I hope that answers the question of the, uh, it's gone already, the question, sorry. <laughs> okay, for the next one, this is from Bapak or Ibu Rosain Bahri Nur. Uh, what are the straightforward signposts for an organization indicating that they are on the right track on the work to institutionalize agility? Um, can I add uh, a question to that? How do you recognize, uh, is there, uh, a trap where you think you're, oh, my organization is already agile, but not really, actually. So you know, I'm going to, uh, can yeah. you still see my screen? I'm not sure if my screen is visible. Uh, yes. Okay, I'm going to go back and let me give you a tool because I love simple tools and I'm sorry, it's way back at the beginning. Uh, I probably should not have done this. Um, it's way, way back here. So, I think it's useful to do this kind of assessment. I think we need a benchmark. And if I'm a business team or a leader, remember I gave you this overall picture of agility. That's four, four definition, four places and practices. I think we should do an assessment like this every six months. What's the environmental change, strategic organization leadership. And then we can begin to create a benchmark of how we're doing on each of the dimensions that I talked about. And that, that assessment lets me monitor, for example, if I'm trying to lose weight, I don't weigh myself every five years. I need to weigh myself periodically to gauge what I'm doing. And this assessment, if you adapted it, might be something you could use. Okay, great, thank you. And then... Let's do two more questions. Okay, so this is from Pa Edwin. Uh, hold on. Uh, how, how do you manage, oh, I'm sorry. So for Pa Edwin, uh, the pro of the agility is flexible, faster, and risk tolerance. The cons, however, there is chaos, rush, and no plans. How do you manage those uh, pro and cons at the same time in achieving the company's goal? Great question. I, uh, and, and by the way, I, I should say, I don't have good answers to these questions. These are one of the realities we live in is uncertainty and, and exploration. One of the things I use the word about four times, and let me use it again in more detail, 
and it's navigate paradox. We're finding in leadership, and let me just do a very brief review. If you were simplifying leadership, there's three stages we've been through. One, leaders have to have character and integrity, seven habits, authenticity, integrity. Second, they need to have emotional intelligence. They need to be emotionally aware, self-aware. Third, they have to have grit, resilience, learning, growth. Fourth, they need to navigate paradox. Paradox together, short-term and long-term, top-down and bottom-up, agility and stability. And the challenge of navigating paradox is to say, we have to move between those two extremes in a continuous flow. If I become too agile and I'm changing too quickly, but I'm not stable, I fail. If I'm too stable and not moving, I fail. And so navigating paradox is having dialogue and debate. One of the reasons I love Asia, Indonesia is good at this. I've been around Indonesian folks who enjoy the debate. They enjoy the dialogue. We disagree without being disagreeable. We have a discussion. We have a disagreement. We have a debate. And then we come together and we move forward. And I think what you just laid out is a fascinating paradox. How do we manage chaos and how do we manage continuity? And learning to navigate between those two extremes becomes one of the great leadership requirements of our time. The great leaders who really move to that high, they talk about humility with confidence. Jack Welch at General Electric. He was bold and aggressive, and he was also humble and willing to learn. And they navigate those paradoxes. Okay. Uh... Oh, that's uh, that's quite a lot of take. <laughs> um, final question. Final yeah, question. Final no, I'm question. going to ask you a question. I get to ask okay. you a question. Okay. Sorry. What's sorry. one thing that excites you about Indonesian leaders? What one thing gives you a sense of confidence about Indonesia's future? You get to see Indonesian leaders more than me by far. You're thoughtful, you're creative, obviously. What's one thing that excites you about Indonesian leaders? Uh, although there has been a lot of talks that the older generations are, you know, old fashioned, but actually I've seen a lot of the older generations uh, willing to work with the younger ones on how to revolutionize their thinking, like actual disc two way discussion on. I need your input because in, in, in Asian Eastern culture, that's not always easy to do. Like seniority matters a lot, but uh, especially with the changes now with the pandemic, I think um, it actually opens this two way discussion from the older nice. generation to the younger ones. And you see that happening some in Indonesia. Yes. So Congratulations. That gives, you a lot of hope. That, is, that gives you great hope. That <laughs> is a wonderful answer. Thank you. You've just taught me something tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You have one final question, then I want one minute at the end. Okay. So this is from Ibu Nindya Tiraharjo. Do this idea of agile organization was the is the best way to create better performance organization. Do you have any solution for the organization member that do not realize the importance of the becoming agile organization? Um, I said it as a tongue in cheek, place them in your competitor. <laughs> no. ah, <right. laughs> I, and that's, yeah, I think most people, it's really interesting. I think right now in America, and I'll use it as an example, I don't know anyone in America, and I don't know that as many people in Indonesia, who would ever claim to be a racist. Nobody would ever claim to be a racist. It's a horrible thought. Everyone would claim to be agile. And yet we do things that we don't appreciate that get in our way of agility. So the, the theory is very simple. When I coach business leaders, we define ourselves by our intentions. I intend to be agile but my behaviors are how other people define me. And so one of the things that I think we have to do to be a better leader and build leadership is make sure that our intentions of agility reflect our behaviors of agile. Now, if somebody, I, I can't imagine very many people in Indonesia's leaders who would say, I don't wanna be agile, I don't wanna change. By the way, they're, they're politicians who won't get elected, they're leaders who won't lead. Most will declare agility, but their behaviors may not reflect it. 
And so I think we need to help people acknowledge you judge yourself by your intent, but your behaviors may not fully reflect the intent that you're communicating. And, and I think we can help people. I have one last message. Okay. And it's my message focusing forward is that prophet who sees the future. I love to ask people the question, what's the best year of your life? And some people go back to when they were 15 or 16 or a child at age four or five or in the university or newly wed. Somebody I asked recently said to me, the best year of my life was the year after I was married. <laughs> so that's, that's another option. <laughs> um, here's my hope and my answer for those listening. I hope the best year of your life is the next 12 months. No matter what happens, we've seen the corona crisis, we've seen a digital revolution, we see uncertainty everywhere. I hope that the agility that we create in ourselves and in others makes the next 12 months always, always the best 12. And with that, I thank you so much. This is where you can get slides. I'll leave it up as we close, but what a privilege. You did a great job doing the MC and monitoring. Thank you. And my you. deep appreciation for the sponsors at the bottom who were so gracious to uh, enable me to join you this week in, uh, in, in, in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, that's the closing statement from Dave. And we have talked a lot. Uh, this takes me back to my college days. So we've talked about the role of board leaders, the why, the what, the where, the how, and finally the who. What's the implication for the boards and leaders, basically the audience for this uh, webinar. So I think the, thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. I hope everyone stays well in uh, Utah. And also in Jakarta. And I hope you'll follow the ideas on LinkedIn. What a privilege. And my deep, deep, deep appreciation for working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with this, sepertinya saya bisa kembalikan ke MC, ke Mbak Indri. Terima kasih untuk uh, para audiens yang sudah bertanya. Maaf apabila saya ada salah kata atau kekurangan yang lain. Baik, Matur Nurum Sanit Gusti Hayu. Luar biasa berjalan dengan sangat lancar sesi hari ini. And we'd like to once again extend our sincere gratitude to Mr. Dave Owit and Gusti Hayu for being here with us today and also for the new insight. We expect it will be beneficial for us and we hope to implement it in our daily lives. Baik, terima kasih sekali lagi Gusti Hayu dan juga thank you so much Jeff Ovage. Dan sekarang Bapak Ibu seluruh peserta sekarang saatnya saya akan mengumumkan seperti tadi di awal ada giveaway 10 buku kita akan langsung tayangkan siapa saja kah yang beruntung. Baik, sudah ada di layar silakan. Ini untuk yang mendapatkan 5 buku Jeff Ulrich, silahkan Bapak Ibu dan nanti untuk pemenang akan dihubungi oleh panitia. Kemudian kita menuju ke 5 pemenang buku selanjutnya. Baik, ini mendapatkan buku dari Bapak Alex Dani dan juga Bapak Triaji. Selamat kepada Bapak Ibu peserta yang sudah mendapatkan buku ya, yang sudah mendapatkan giveaway. Selamat sekali lagi yang belum beruntung jangan berkecil hati. Pasti nanti akan mendapatkan giveaway di acara kami selanjutnya. Dan Bapak Ibu, kami juga menyediakan form. Silahkan diisi terlebih dahulu. Ya, baik. Dan form ini adalah evaluasi yang akan digunakan untuk pelaksanaan webinar di sesi selanjutnya untuk lebih baik. Baik, untuk itu kami persilahkan kepada Bapak Ibu untuk mengisi form tersebut dan sambil mengisi kami juga ingin mengucapkan terima kasih yang sebesar-besarnya kepada Direksi Holding Perkebunan, Direksi LPP, Ketua FHCI, Bapak Ferdinand masih bersama kita juga dan juga seluruh peserta. Sekali lagi terima kasih. Ini uh, masih bertahan banyak sekali memang materinya bagus sekali ya pagi hari ini. Baik, ya ini adalah kita Ya, ini silahkan diisi, Bapak Ibu. Baik, dan tentu saja Bapak Ibu nanti.
sekali lagi saya informasikan bahwa untuk pemenang giveaway nanti akan dihubungi oleh penelitia dan kami juga mengucapkan kepada seluruh peserta Tour Post Pandemic Adventure Part 4 dengan tema Building Agility for the Next Generation Organization. Terima kasih untuk partisipasinya yang sangat luar biasa. Baik, kalau begitu Bapak Ibu silakan Anda mengisi linknya. Saya Indriya Sasutomo, pamit undur diri. Selamat beraktivitas Bapak Ibu. Selamat siang, sampai jumpa.